Welcome to today's special program. My name is Pastor David Longobardo, and we have an outstanding guest. Uh, he is a prolific author. In fact, I would bet most of you have at least one or two of his books in your personal library. Lee Strobel is his name, and he's most well known for his book, Case for Christ. But he's also written Case for Faith. Case for the Creator, Case for Grace, uh, just many, many different books. Let me give you a little bit of a, a handle. He's the former award-winning legal editor of the Chicago Tribune. And uh, uh, he is also a former atheist who came to Christ and faith in Christ and uh, has been serving Christ ever since. It is our joy and our privilege to have Lee Strobel on the program today. Lee, we welcome you. Thank you so much. Great to be with you. Uh, everybody knows you're an outstanding author. How many <laughs> books have you written? Oh, golly. I had to do a list recently, and I think it's over 40. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> kind of, kind of, I told my wife, no wonder I'm tired. <laughs> I read in one of your bios yeah. that it amounts to over 14 million copies. Yeah. Yeah. That's fantastic. And you know what's especially exciting to me is it's been translated in so many languages. So that there are people in China right now um, where maybe, you know, I may be sleeping here in the United States and it's daytime over there and somebody's reading a book. And um, so I want to reach the whole world and to know that it's in so many languages is a blessing. Now, Case for Christ yeah. became a film as well. That's right. And Case for Heaven, yes. a documentary. Right. Uh, do most of your books have films or documentaries? Some that... of them do. We did uh, also one on Case for Faith a number of years ago and Cre Case for Creator a number of years ago. Uh, we're in the process of doing one on the Case for Miracles. It should come out in 2024. Um, you know, uh, cinema is the language of young people. Yes. And so I thought, you know, I can write books, but if I want to reach young people, i got to speak their language. And they're visual and they love film. And so, why not? Hand in hand. Yeah. Let's go into a little bit of background. Yeah. Um, we mentioned former atheists. Yes. Give us your educational background, your mm -hmm. personal background, how you became that atheist, and yeah. then how you became a believer in Christ. Yeah, I, was, um, I grew up in Chicago. Um, my parents were both believers in God and Christ. Um, but, you know, they kind of let me carve my own path. Yeah. And so by the time I got in high school, there were three steps that led me into atheism. Number one, when I was in junior high school, I would start asking those embarrassing questions like, why, if there's a loving God, is there so much suffering in the world? How could God send people to hell? And nobody wanted to engage with me. And so I thought, oh, I get it. There's no good answer. Yep. Second step was in high school, I learned about Darwin, Darwinian evolution. Sure. And so God's out of a job. You don't need God. He, yep. Everything happened naturally. And then the third step at the University of Missouri, where I went to study journalism, uh, I took a course on Jesus taught by an atheist. Wow. And uh, so those were sort of my three steps into atheism. And um, I went to the University of Missouri journalism school. I went to Yale Law School to get a Master of Studies in Law degree. I was a legal editor of the Chicago Tribune. I lived a very immoral life. Drunken, profane, narcissistic life. Um, I married my high school sweetheart, who didn't know anything about God either. Uh, she was kind of agnostic. And um, she ended up coming to faith through a friend who shared Jesus with her. And my wife checked it out. And so be before you did? Before I did. did. Okay. And um, I remember when she came and told me. It, what a dilemma. <laughs> it, it, yeah, it was one of the worst days for an atheist husband. Yeah. I mean, first word that went through my mind was divorce. Yeah. I was yeah. going to walk out. Yeah. But I stuck around. There were a lot of positive changes in her character and in her values. They kind of kind of um, draw, drew me toward faith a bit. But at the same time, I wanted the old Leslie back. Yeah. I wanted her old life back. Yeah. So I thought, how do I rescue her from this cult? And, and so I figured if I could disprove the resurrection of Jesus... I could dismantle Christianity. And I thought, hey, I'm trained in law. Certainly I can investigate this. Give me a long weekend. I'm sure I can disprove it. Well, I ended up spending two years of my life investigating the historical data for the resurrection okay. of Jesus. 
and became, on November the 8th of 1981, totally convinced that Jesus not only claimed to be the Son of God, but he backed it up by returning from the dead. And that's the day I realized this is true. Um, no question I was a sinner. I had no doubts about that. Repented of my sin, received forgiveness through Christ, and um, was born again, as they say. And, and my life, my values, my character, my morality, my attitudes, my priorities, my relationships, my marriage, all these things uh, began to change for the good over time. I can tell you this, as a pastor, yeah. um, knowing when I saw your credentials mm. and your background, yeah. even though at the time you were unsaved and atheist right. in terms of your background, um, it, it grabbed my attention because mm. I wanted to see how this well-educated, mm. bright, good-thinking man would present the claims of Christ. Yeah. And uh, the very title, The Case for Christ, yeah. uh, captured my attention. Mm. I, I must have at least six or seven of your books in my personal <laughs> library. And, uh, and I love the approach that you take. Mm. Uh, but I, I want to ask you this. So it was through your wife and through you trying to disprove the yeah. resurrection. Did you end up meeting Dr. Habermas during that research process? You know, I, I, I ended up ultimately doing that because when I did my research, I wasn't planning to write a book. Yeah. You know, I was, so I would read all this stuff. And um, then after I came to faith, Leslie, my wife, said to me, you ought to write a book about that. I said, really? I, I don't know. I, gotta, I never took notes on some of this stuff. And, and so I went out and I interviewed these authors who I had read, like Gary Habermas, a great resurrection yep. scholar, wonderful man. Interviewed him. Uh, interviewed great him. Guy. William Lane Craig, the great yep. philosopher, yep. and um, J.P. Moreland, great yep. philosopher, Good and so people. forth. So I've gotten to know a lot of these wonderful Christian apologists, yes. which is a term that means someone who deals in arguments for the faith and evidence exactly. for the faith. Yeah. One of your more recent books is A Case for Heaven. Yes. Uh, vitally important topic. Yeah. Uh, we live in a world right now that has a big question mark yeah. out there right. about the reality of heaven and more even about the reality of hell. Yes. Um, tell me how you approached it, yeah. who you talked to, yeah. and how, uh, how you reached... Uh, the biblical conclusions yeah. you did after that process? Well, there were really two lines of evidence. One is Jesus himself. Yes. Did he really die and return from the dead? If that's true, then he's not only an eyewitness to the afterlife, yes. he created the afterlife. Exactly. He's the son of God. So um, I, I look into the resurrection again, make sure that that evidence is strong. And then I go to Jesus and say, what did he say about heaven? Yep. What did he say about hell? We can trust that. But the second line of evidence was really fascinating. I was a skeptic about this, and that's near-death experiences. Mm -hmm. um, I found out that there are 900 scholarly articles written about near-death experiences in scientific and medical journals over the last 40 years. Wow. This is a well-researched area. And what did I find? I found well-documented cases where people were clinically dead, and yet they said later, I was alive the whole time. And um, they saw things or experienced or heard things that would have been impossible for them to see or hear unless they really did have an out-of-body experience. Wow. And so I researched those and became convinced that 900 they are, is a large it's, number. It's a lot. And um, I'll give you one quick example. A woman named Maria, a migrant worker who died of a heart attack in the hospital in Seattle. She's, she's got a heart attack. But she says, my soul separated from my body, which is what the Bible says. When we die, our soul separates from our body. And she said, I was floating there and I was watching the resuscitation efforts. But then my soul floated out of the hospital. And then when she was revived and her soul returned to her body, she said, by the way, on the third story ledge of the hospital, there's a tennis shoe. And it's left footed, it's a man's shoe, it's dark blue. Oh there's Lord. a little wear over the little toe and the shoelace is tucked under the heel. So they go up, they look on the roof, they look on the ledge, 
Here it is, exactly as she said. There's no way she could have seen that unless it was true. So the Bible says, the Bible teaches that when we die, our soul, our spirit separates from our body. And and then is either in the presence of God or separated from God. And then at the end of history, when Jesus returns, um, there's a final judgment. And then we go ultimately to heaven or hell for eternity. Um, so this is very consistent. In fact, I interviewed a guy named John Burke. He's a Christian pastor. He studied a thousand near-death experiences. And his conclusion is, if you look at the commonality of what happens in a typical near-death experience, not how people interpret it, but what actually happens, it's consistent with Christian scripture. Wow. So that was a powerful um, confirming bit of evidence that indeed we do live on after our death. And by the way, Howard Storm, who's in my book, uh, had a hellish experience. He was an atheist who died. He had a hellish experience. And so powerful was it that he ended up renouncing his atheism, resigning his tenured position at a secular university, going to seminary, becoming a pastor, and today he's pastor of a little church. Powerful. Yeah. Uh, I'm interested in something. Prior to your conversion, you were an atheist, you were a skeptic. Okay. Um, all of these books, Case for Christ, Case for Faith, Case for Grace, Case for Heaven, have you been contacted mm. much by skeptics oh, yeah. yourself oh. that have read your book and oh. maybe wanted to challenge or question you? And g- Give us an interaction maybe that you've had with some skeptic that made contact with you. You know what I get most common? And this I'm talking several a week is people who said, I was an atheist, I was a skeptic, I read your book, I received Christ, and I'm a born-again follower of Jesus. I got one just yesterday um, um, from people. I mean, Evil Knievel, the great motorcycle daredevil rider, came to faith. His Uh, son just recently died. His son just recently died. This last week, I think, yeah. But I picked up my phone one day, and the voice said, is this Lee Strobel? I said, yes. And the voice said, this is evil. And I thought... (laughs) Satan has got my phone number. He says, no, he said, no, evil can I thought evil. I gave I like, that up a yeah, long time ago. Right. And he said, no, evil. Oh, okay. So we became friends. Wow. And he said, I'm standing. He lived a wild life. Yes, he, he did. He had a woman in every city. Yep. He was a drunk. He beat up a business associate with a baseball bat and went to prison. I mean, he was a tough guy. He's standing on the beach in Florida toward the end of his life, and God spoke to him and said, Robert, I've saved you more times than you'll ever know. Now you need to come to me through my son, Jesus. And he said, I don't even know who Jesus is. So he called the only Christian he knew, Frank Gifford, the sportscaster, yep. and said, Frank, who's Jesus? And Frank said, get the case for Christ. And so evil, get it. He re- anyway, evil Knievel was, had a radical conversion, was wow. born again. When he was baptized, he shared his testimony. 700 people came to faith. Now that's powerful. It, it but was he was powerful. so well known. Exactly. And, and everybody knew evil right. Knievel. And when he died about a year and a half later, on his tombstone, he has engraved, believe in Jesus. Powerful. Yeah. We're coming right back. Our guest is Lee Strobel. And what a fascinating time we're having. Uh, I know you're enjoying it. But we have a little message we want uh, to convey to you uh, from Lee, from ourselves. Watch this. We'll be right back. The Intensive 2023 featuring Lee Strobel and with special guests, Lieutenant General Jerry Boykin, Bishop Larry Jackson, and Jahan Burns. January 27th and 28th at the Crossing Church, 1130 North Main Street in Kernersville. Thank you very much. Global Television is able to bring you programs like this because of your prayers and your support. Thank you so very much. Our guest is Lee Strobel. We're focusing on a variety of books that he has written. One of the most recent, 
uh, a case for heaven. But I want to explore something else, Lee. I read in your bio uh, that you have the Lee Strobel, is it School of Evangelism it, it's a Lee and Strobel Apologetics? C- Lee Strobel Center for Evangelism and Applied Apologetics. At Colorado Christian University. That's right, yes. How did that come about? That's a great question. You know, I've written a lot of books, and, and um, but I thought, what can I leave as a legacy to really impact the world, impact churches around the United States and beyond? And so we gathered 40 PhDs who are experts in evangelism and defending the faith, apologetics. We created 91 courses, fully accredited, wow. fully online, undergraduate degree and master's degree level. And then we created certificate courses. These are for people that don't want another sure, degree. Sure. But uh, if you take five of these courses, you get a certificate. Wow. So you, can, you can get one in evangelism. You get one in apologetics. You can get one in world religions. You get one in cultural apologetics, which are key, uh, social issues like abortion and same-sex marriage and so forth. And uh, so we launched this center with the hope that we could educate um, um, America to be able to share the faith in an increasingly skeptical culture. Sure. And we've been thrilled with the number of people who've uh, gone through our program, gotten their master's degrees. We were just graduating our first master's degree. And it's virtually all online? It is all online. Okay. 100% online. Okay. So huh. you get a master's degree, it's designed for busy people. Um, but it, it, it's, so it's done in a way, all of our courses are only five weeks long. That way it's doable if you got a job, you're a plumber or you're a teacher or whatever, you got time to be able to do this. But here's the key. We're not trying to create ivory tower intellectuals. Mm -hmm. We're trying to create people who will put this into action. So we call it applied apologetics. I want people who are going to... Practical Christianity. Exactly. Who are going to use it, who are going to talk to the guy across the uh, street, the neighbor who doesn't know Christ, who who are going to do podcasts, who are going to do YouTube things, who are going to write letters to the editor of the newspaper, who are going to be active in sharing and, and defending the faith. So we're really excited about it. That is very exciting. I want to explore something. Maybe it's out of personal curiosity yeah. more than anything else. But knowing the background you came from, then your conversion, then being the author that you are, what most people may not know is that you have served in churches. Yes. A number, several. Yes. Very large churches. Yes. I would like to know what your experience mm. has been You've got this background in journalism, this background as an author, uh, atheistic background, you get saved, you get converted, and now you get plugged into serving uh, as a minister on the staff of a church. Give us what that experience has been like for you in light of your background. It's been wonderful. It seriously has been wonderful. I mean, I've been blessed to be part of three major churches yes. that, um, um, that I've served at as teaching pastor. And I'm telling you, I know people, there's conflicts in local churches. We're all sinners who are part of a church. And we I have know this things, treasure in earthen vessels. Exactly. <laughs> but boy, I'm telling you, when the church is focused on um, evangelism, trying to reach a community with the gospel, and growing up people in their faith, and you've got sincere people who are, who are godly Christ followers who are dedicated to that. Nothing is more exciting than the local church. And I believe in it. Um, our center at Colorado Christian University has a six-stage process that we develop that churches go through, and it increases their evangelistic effectiveness. Um, so we believe in the local church. We're training people to be evangelism leaders in local churches, um, I didn't want to do something that was apart from what God is doing. The church is the bride of Christ. Yes, it is. And, and so we need to work through the church. That is his primary mechanism for reaching the world with the gospel. So I believe in the church. Um, I, I cheer on the church. I just today just met with a whole bunch of pastors from this area and encouraged them. And I'm proud of them. Uh, uh, and you talk to any given pastor and you ask him, why did you go in the ministry? And they will tell you, because I want to see people's lives transform like God's Change transform. Change and transform, exactly. Yeah. Help, help pastors and leaders, yeah. church workers, with this. If you were to recommend to a pastor mm-hmm. or a Christian education minister in the church, yeah. what type of curriculum material, mm. teaching material, yeah. would you recommend 
that they focus on in their adult education yeah. ministry, even in their children or college. Sure. What, what kind of topics yeah. would you focus on? Well, I would focus uh, on evangelism and apologetics. Yep. We have a course through our university and also separate from that called Contagious Faith by my, the executive director of our center, Mark Middleberg. And it's a breakthrough course. You can take your church through it because it teaches that there are different kinds of styles of evangelism in sure. the New Testament. We don't have to, I don't have to do it like you. Yep. You don't have to do it like me. We're all made a little differently. That's okay. God can use us. So that course helps people discover what their style is so they're more willing to share their faith. I think um, to be able to defend the faith. Uh, I did a curriculum with Mark Middleberg called Making Your Case for Christ. And it trains people in apologetics Excellent. as well as evangelism. So there's some good stuff out there. I'm interested in this. You've written 40, 50 books, whatever the number is. Tell me what other books are in that heart <laughs> of yours. Are, are there other topics you're looking at wanting to write on? I'm actually working on a book right now. I found it. My publisher called me and said, Lee, are you aware that 200 times a second around the clock, Someone is typing in an internet search engine, basically the question, is God real? Wow. People want to know. Um, and so they said, would you write a book called, Is God Real? Powerful. So that's what I'm doing. It comes out October 31st, 2023. And it's a book for Christians to deepen their faith, but a book they can give away exactly. to someone who's spiritually a seeking yep. a tool along those lines. So I'm very excited about that project um, because there is good reason to believe that there is God, that God is real. Amen. Yeah. Um, Lee, do something. There's a camera right there. Yeah. Look into it. There are people that are watching right now who may not know our Savior, just yeah. like you didn't, just yeah. like I didn't at yeah. one point in time in my life. And let's give them the opportunity to receive Christ and then do one other thing, and that is this. Um, let people know what steps they can take to equip themselves better, yeah. to be a witness, to share Christ, uh, to be an apologist yeah. in their own right. Sure. Take a minute. Yeah, you know, if you go to strobelcenter.com, it has all the information on our center. You can take a certificate course at your own pace. It's very inexpensive. And um, you can learn how to defend your faith and how to share it more effectively. Uh, but maybe, as you said, you're sitting there going, I'm one that wants to know, is God real? You're typing that into a search engine. You know, the Bible says in John 1, 12, uh, as many as received him, yes. to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. So the formula there is believe plus receive equals become. So if you want to become a child of God who is confident you're going to heaven, you have to believe. Believe what? That Jesus is who he claimed to be, the one and only Son of God. He proved it by returning from the dead. And if you believe that, then the next step, is to receive. So let me lead you in a prayer to, to, to receive Jesus as your forgiver and as your leader. Just, just pray this. Don't even close your eyes. Look at me right now. Just look at me as we pray. Just say, Lord Jesus, as best I can, I do believe that you are the Son of God. And right now, I admit the obvious, which is that I'm a sinner. I know that. I've done things I knew they were wrong before I did them, and I did them anyway. I've sinned. And I want to turn from that. And in an attitude of repentance and faith, I want to receive. I want to receive your free gift of forgiveness and eternal life. Thank you, Jesus, for loving me so much. You endured the torture of the cross so that we could be reconciled forever. Help me, Jesus. To live the kind of life that you want me to live. Yes. Because from this moment on, I am yours. Friends, if you prayed that prayer right now and you meant it, God has come into your life. He will change you over time. You need to find a good church, a local church, where you can become part of that fellowship and grow in your relationship with God. Friends, this is the most important thing you can do yes, in your is. life. Because it will determine how you spend your eternity. Thank you. I want you to know, if you just prayed that prayer, at the end of this broadcast, we're going to bring up the name and phone number and address of this ministry. 
write down that phone number. Give us a call. Let us know, let others know that you receive Christ today. And as Lee just said, find a church. Get plugged in where you can grow. You've come to faith, but now you want to grow in your faith. And you can do that through a great local church as I have served, as Lee has served. And then thirdly, it is so very important. We don't just hold on to our faith. We give it away. We share it with others. And I want to encourage you to be one like Lee, like myself, that shares your faith with others. Lee, we only have a couple of minutes left. Yeah. What a privilege oh, this that this has been. Uh, been an absolute blessing. Um, what does your future look like now? Uh, yeah. What are the kind of goals or, or, or focus that you have for your future? Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll continue to write books if God puts them on my heart. I, want, I don't want to write books just to write books. Sure. It, it, it's always feeling a strong leading from God to write a book. And so I'll probably write a few more. Um, the center, Lee Strobel Center at Colorado Christian University, uh, is um, really the focus of what I'm doing now. I want to train people to defend and share the faith into the future. And I want to be a great grandfather Amen. to my four grandchildren. I want to be a great father to my two children. My one son is a professor of theology. My daughter is a, uh, at Biola University, Talbot School of Theology. Did you go to, come on. I grew up in Southern California. Biola University is my is Oh my, my goodness. College. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, he's a, he got his PhD at Aberdeen. Is he at Talbot? Uh, uh, no, he got his PhD. Yeah, he's a professor at Talbot, teaches spiritual formation. Great place. Great place. Great place. Uh, I, it has been labeled the best Christian university yeah. and seminary on the West Coast. It definitely and is. I think it's, uh, it's in the top five of the nation. Excellent, excellent. <laughs> excellent. And, uh, so I got four grandkids. Um, they're coming to faith one by one. And um, uh, to be able to watch that and witness that. My daughter's a homeschooling expert. She has a website called uh, goodschooling.net. And she coaches people how to homeschool. If you're a Christian and you don't like your local school, here's an opportunity to learn to homeschool. Lee, thank you so much. Hey, Keep up pleasure. the great work. I want to just share with you, it is our joy to bring you guests like this. Uh, Global Christian Television is able to do so because of your prayers and your support. Our phone number is coming up. If you receive Christ, give us a call. God bless you. Mm -hmm.